Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump, a weekly show in which we talk with people who have had or have undergone a spiritual awakening. I'm always trying to come up with better terminology than that, but so far that's the best I've come up with. Maybe my guest to, to, to this week, Sandra, Sandra Glickman, will uh, coin a better phrase for me. Um, Sandra holds the distinction of being the first guest on this show to not have a TM background, Transcendental <laughs> Meditation background, which is great. Not, not that there's anything wrong with having a TM background, but it's hard to find anybody <laughs> in Fairfield, Iowa who doesn't have one and, who yet, and yet who you know, has had a spiritual awakening. So I was glad that uh, Sandra agreed to come on the show. So maybe that gives us a good starting point, actually. Um, how did you end up in Fairfield? Okay. Um, I was living in California, mm -hmm. San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, I was involved in a practice there uh, with a group of people called Waking Down mm -hmm. in Mutuality. And uh, this group was invited to come to Fairfield and teach, do, do some introductory teaching and um, uh, bringing our ideas about awakening mm -hmm. to a group of people here. You mean you're asked to have a representative come? Yes. I see. Yes. And so I happened to be the representative, mm -hmm. uh, myself and an another woman yeah. whom I teach with. And so we came here, we gave an introductory course, and uh, we came back again, and people liked what we were doing. So mm -hmm. we were invited back quite a few times, and over time, um, I got acquainted with the town and the wonderful community of people here. Mm. Very lively, very juicy, very ready to get involved in uh, another angle on spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time, I met my partner, Don Schmidt, mm -hmm. here, who came to some of the classes. And uh, over time, you know, we kind of decided that we'd like to spend more time together, and then we did some traveling together, and then we finally we decided we'd like to try living together. Mm -hmm. And it felt really ready-made for me because I was really wanting to have this relationship with Don deepen mm -hmm. and uh, grow more uh, full over time, and I was really tired of California, believe it or not. Hmm. I was really saturated. I spent most of my life there, and um, I was drawn to the community here. So right. I had a ready-made teaching gig and <laughs> lots yeah. of friends already here and a relationship, and, and I was ready to leave where I was. So it Sounds was, like the right thing to do. It was a great thing to do, and I've been very, very happy here. Yeah. How long have you been here now? It's been about five and a half years. Okay. Yeah. You like the winters? I don't mind them. Okay, I don't do mind I. them. I love them, actually. I like to get out and cross-country yeah. cross ski. Yeah. <clears throat> well, one of the things is I'm not a native Californian. Oh. You know, I, I grew up actually in Kansas. Oh, okay. So coming back here, I kind of reconnected yeah. to my roots. Pretty similar. You know? mm -hmm. Fairly similar, yeah. and I actually love the seasons, and I, I yeah. know that's... So I don't mind the winners. Good. That's good. So um, you, w you had a spiritual awakening. Were you on a kind of a, a path of a seeker for decades before that? Or did it just you know, strike, hit you out of the blue one day when you were crossing the street or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I've been a lifelong seeker. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking back over that uh, period of my life like, at age 20, I think I was just like an empty, hollow, boring, you know, uh, bored person. Mm -hmm. And I felt the kind of sting of existence. But by 30, I began to say, turn around in my life and begin to look for the light. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my first conception of what a spiritual awakening was. Started reading books and Yeah, whatnot. started reading books. I got interested in Edgar Cayce. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. when I, when I learned that he was talking about reincarnation, I said, why didn't anyone ever tell me this? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew it was so, and I, I was kind of ignited by that idea. And so mm -hmm. I continued to read more along the lines of psychic material and, um, uh, I began to investigate uh, healing energies and 
subtle energies. I remember spending a lot of time trying to see auras, you know. Mm -hmm. So my first idea of spiritual life was that to get in touch with that which is not physical, right. but maybe connected with the physical, but subtle physical. Subtle, yeah. subtle physical. Yeah. And uh, I did the Course in Miracles. I did many things and I started investigating palmistry and phrenology <laughs> and numerology uh -huh. and tarot and I, I was on a mission to see, you know, what all of these approaches could tell me about life hmm. and tell me about my own character and my own spiritual nature. Did you pursue them kind of simultaneously or sequentially? All these uh, things? Simultaneously. Yeah. I've always been one of these. So you're just checking everything out right yes. willy-nilly. Yes, everything. Yeah. Voracious appetite uh -huh. for everything unusual. <laughs> were you doing some kind of actual practice, uh, sitting and meditating or something, or were you just kind of reading things and thinking about things more? I was more reading and thinking and, yeah. and uh, you know, fishing around for everything. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was raising a family. I was right. married and raising a family. And so um, at a certain point, um, I went through a divorce and then I decided I need a profession. Hmm. And I kind of um, discovered that the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology was right in my own hometown. Huh. And when I visited there, I thought, wow, I can get a degree in everything I'm interested oh, in. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> because um, it was a very multidisciplinary school and it was very experientially based. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, studies in five different areas of human endeavor. And so um, that's when my, I became more disciplined. I began meditating regularly and uh, reading and studying and writing papers and uh, I was exposed to a lot of spiritual teachers hmm. on a regular they basis. They would come through and lecture there or something? Yeah, they were associated with the school. Right. And, um, and so... This is out in California? Uh, yes, yeah. California in the Bay Area. Okay. Uh -huh. And during that time I also uh, was, I had also been visiting a teacher in Oklahoma City that my sister introduced me to he was a yogi, I guess you would say, because he would take us on these inner journeys, mm. a whole group of people, on these guided inner journeys into the subtle realms, ascending realms huh. of awareness and consciousness. Was an American or an Indian? Oh, he was American, but okay. he was trained himself by uh, Indian uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, he led us on the most fantastical experiences, you know, mm. with... So you'd just be sitting in a room with him, and, yes. and he would t somehow do something or other, and you would actually... You yeah, he would say, okay, I'm going, follow me, you know, really? and it was like he you had... You were able to just follow. He had the power, you know, he had that kind of city to pull people into his Some experience. Yeah. Uh-huh, and so we traveled with him in the inner worlds, and, huh. and every time I would go there, he would say, this is it, I've got it now. And he would sketch out on a board all the inner worlds that he was working with, uh -huh. and and first we see it and then we feel it and then we become it and then we fill it in with our awareness and then it's ours huh. you know and then I come back next time and he say well there's something beyond this huh. and I kept expecting to find you know where's the end point yeah where's where's the um, foundation yeah what are we looking for here right <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I realized this is going to go on forever right and even though I had amazing and wonderful and beautiful experiences there, mm -hmm. I kind of came to the realization that this is not where it's at. Right. And also you might have realized at that point that, you know, you only have these experiences when you're in Oklahoma City and that doesn't cut it out in the Bay Area. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was incrementally becoming more sensitive right. and more self-aware, you know. But it's true. It's like it was kind of a group experience and I also had kind of had this intuition, this isn't my way, you right. know, this isn't innate to my nature. Mm -hmm. So um, I continued, by then I was in the School of Transpersonal Psychology and I was being exposed to many different disciplines that I was feeling more uh, related and, and kind of more aligned with those disciplines. <coughs> So I was getting my degree there and I was going on to be a counselor in the clinic there. 
and uh, working for my license. And mm -hmm. I was very happy with that as a profession mm -hmm. and as a way of expressing myself and learning. And then, at the same time, I somehow became introduced to um, the spiritual adept Adi Das Samraj. Right. And uh, that was a really amazing opening. Hmm. You know, uh, spending time in his tent while he talked with people and did satsang, and I would come away in great, you know, waves of bliss, being uplifted beyond myself. And so it wasn't hard to sign up to be a student there and mm -hmm. to study uh, on a very regular basis. Mm. And I started going up to Lake County where he had a sanctuary. And I spent a lot of time there with the group, practicing in that community. Uh, and it, these were comprehensive life practices. Everyday meditation, puja, puja, chanting, study, diet practices. That's what you mean by comprehensive, that they were multifaceted and you d did all yeah. these things. Every yeah. Day. yeah, we had prescriptions for how to lead our lives every moment of the day. You Sounds know. familiar. Yeah. <laughs> this was my uh, big guru uh, phase. learning phase, right? Yeah. right? And, uh, and also, uh, the study there was very rich because we studied the traditions, you know, mm -hmm. and I got a very solid foundation for what the spiritual path actually is mm -hmm. and how one develops through the stages. Mm -hmm. And um, I had many, many... Uh, awakenings. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any one awakening. You know, I had many awakenings in that community. Mm -hmm. Awakenings in consciousness at many different stages. Personal realizations of my own um, unity and light and my um, own deeper intelligence at work. And when you had those awakenings, was it sort of an I got it, I lost it kind of thing or was it more like you know, a stage and then stabilize that and then a new stage and then stabilize that and, and so on? Um, well, I wouldn't say it was either. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that uh, clearly incremental, uh -huh. you know, you achieve a stage and you stabilize, right. you achieve another stage and you stabilize. And I wouldn't say that I lost it. Mm -hmm. Something always remained and yeah. something kept kept being added and kept being fuller and fuller. And um, it, it built, mm -hmm. you know, and my own confidence in the spiritual life built and changed. And um, I was in that community for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then... Living uh, in it or going and visiting? Kind well, of back and uh, I lived in two places. Like half the week I did I my see. practice right. in the Bay Area and the other so half... So by this time you had graduated from the transpersonal thing. Yes. You had a degree and you yes. were seeing clients yes. and going... Yes. Yeah, okay. And, and then I'd go up for four days on the weekend mm -hmm. and live in the community and mm -hmm. go to the sanctuary. And that's an empowered place, mm -hmm. you know. It was like, it was easy to have deep meditations and right. to have um, revelations mm -hmm. and... And I and Adi Da himself came many times to the sanctuary when I was there. So I had darshan, mm -hmm. and um, I served a lot. I I became a mad devotee. This was right. my mad devotee phase, <laughs> running all over the sanctuary, throwing myself on the ground, you know, and like offering flowers and mm -hmm. weeping and tearing your hair, and uh -huh. it was wonderful. I loved it. It was just. Um, it was giving oneself over to, you know, the r passion of the religious experience and the devotion to the great divine other, right. you know. And then there came a time when things sort of leveled off and all of that wasn't popping and happening, you mm -hmm. know. I had taken on some responsibility, responsibilities to lead groups in mm -hmm. my local area and um, I was very convinced. I just felt like, well, things are leveling off. I don't feel the growth I'm, you know, that I have had. But 
this is my guru. I'm going to be here my whole life, and that's how it is, you know. Uh, and your children, you had children at this point. Yes, I did. What, yeah. what was that? With it? Did you take them with you up to the sanctuary when you went there? Or no. Your husband, they stayed with your husband? Yeah, or? my ex-husband and the children. Uh, the children chose to live with him. Oh, I see. Well, you, you were tearing your hair out, <laughs> throwing yourself on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> I know, my children, and that was like, that was quite a time period in my life, you yeah. know. That was a that was a real wound. It was kind of hard for me to get over, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I honored their choice right. and I understood why they made it. And I also had this other urge to become a professional and, and follow a spiritual path. So I saw them, of course, we lived close to each other and right. I saw them a lot, but I didn't have to um, keep a household for them. I see. No. They gave you the mm -hmm. freedom to... Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right, so things were kind of leveling off. He was still your guru, but the, maybe the fireworks weren't quite there as much as right. before. And right. so take us from right. there. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, I felt content. I, mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't feel like I was seeking anything. But at this point, I heard that one of his former students, Samuel Bonder, mm -hmm. had left the communion and that after he left, that he became awakened. Right. And this news was like radical in the community because oh. the way it was set up was that the guru was the enlightened, aw awakened, and powerful one. Yeah. And everyone else was told, you know, uh, go back to the drawing board. You're, you know, you're half-baked, you're not there. And no one was really ever encouraged to go further in what they were actually opening up to. Interesting. Mm. The whole thing was that you were to be a devotee and you were to um, uh, submit to the belief that only a few in any lifetime awaken mm. and that it was arduous and difficult right. and you, <clears throat> you, know, you were full of egotism if you thought you were getting anywhere. Sounds very familiar. <laughs> I've heard that in several different uh -huh. spiritual circles. I was told, my favorite profession, I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist, uh -huh. I was told, you know, if you want to get anywhere, you should drop this. Hmm. Psychology is a backwater, you know, it's mm -hmm. a delusion. You'll yeah. never make it if you're a psychologist. And um, you know what? I was too much in possession of my own self by then. Hmm. I had, I had grown, I had integrated a lot of my shadow material. I had understood my patterns and how I worked. I had had uh, exposure to many different teachers by then. Mm -hmm. And I just intuitively knew that was not right. Yeah. I, I didn't, I, I was not gonna be someone who stripped myself down to nothing and just submitted, right. uh, you know, childlike to a, a, this guru. Mm -hmm. So I did not do that. I, I refused to do that. When, when word came back that Samuel had left and gotten awakened, did many people in that community uh, believe it? Or did, was he pretty much castigated as being some sort of oh, he was, off the program? He was scorned, dude, and, yeah. scorned and castigated. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but an interesting thing happened. You know, I, I kind of started thinking, well, you know. Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> And incidentally, uh, Samuel Bonder happened to have a business relationship with a man who was my partner at that time. And mm -hmm. he was coming down to Palo Alto to study the flute, the wood flute. Samuel? Yes. Uh -huh. And he also would come down and he would have business meetings, lunch meetings with my partner. And so finally one day my partner came home and said, now, you have to come and meet Samuel Bonder because I don't have enough sensitivity to know what he's talking about <laughs> and <laughs> to be able to make any evaluation of it. So right. I said, oh, okay, I'll go. Well, when I arrived and had lunch with him and after just a few minutes conversation, it was totally obvious to me that this was a person who was awake. Mm -hmm. How was it obvious to you? He felt no different from Adi Da in his conscious nature, mm -hmm. you know. He was, he was full, he was in his being, he was bright, he was clear, mm -hmm. he was um, kind and loving, mm. and you know, it, I recognized, I just recognized the same qualities mm -hmm. 
that I had seen in my guru. Right. And um, so I said, wow, this is really cool. So Samuel had just written an important book that kind of uh, documented his own journey. I think I read that book years ago. It, yeah. yeah. He, it, he, it was called, um, let's see, what is the name of it? White Heart Yoga of yep. the Heart. That's the one I read. You read that? Well, I listened to it on tape, actually. Okay. Uh, I think it exists mm -hmm. on tape. And my wife and I were driving down to New Mexico, and mm -hmm. I, I listened to it on the trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I th it must have been that book because he kept saying white hot a lot. Yes. <laughs> in the book. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and my wife was saying, that's it. give me a break. What is this white hot? <laughs> I know. That's still a, that's still a, a mysterious <laughs> phrase. Um, so, Samuel, the next time he came down, he delivered this book to our door. Mm -hmm. And I started reading the book. And I really recognized if this man is telling the truth about his own journey, he knows. He has been through the transformational journey. Mm -hmm. And the criticisms he was bringing, you know, to his life in the community with Adi Da rang true for me. Criticisms he was bringing? Yeah, he was saying, you know, um, because of the setup there that um, no one would be affirmed. I see. You know, that the guru held all the power. Yeah. And it wasn't just he was holding it. The devotees were giving it to him. Were giving it all to him. Right. I knew people in that community. It was clear to me that they were awake. Mm -hmm. They were clear. They were there. And I had said to one of these persons in particular, why don't you say something? And she said, oh, no, no, no. That's not my role. Mm -hmm. That's not who I am. Yeah. You know, it's just like there was mm -hmm. no invitation, there was no support for actually receiving yourself where you actually were, mm -hmm. because it would be an affront to the guru. It would. It was taboo. And um, I don't know if it was actually taboo to him, although he kicked out Samuel Bonder. Mm -hmm. But why was Samuel getting a little bit too independent? And well, Samuel was kind like self-fulfilled uh, yeah, or whatever. He was kind of like refusing to comply with every last yeah. request. Yeah, it's it's common. I mean, this is a universal pattern, actually. Yes. it happens in the two spiritual organizations that I've been familiar mm -hmm. with. I've seen it over and over again, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's it's more like I think of a, an organization like that as being an incubator. And once, right. once the chick is kind of out of the shell, it's not very helpful to stay in the incubator, either for that chick or for the other eggs in the incubator. <laughs> you know, so I like that metaphor. Time to get out. I really know? like that yeah. metaphor. I, I discovered it myself. I discovered, and I, I kind of had this inner play between myself and the guru that I kind of knew he was putting up the heat on everybody. Mm -hmm. And that was the confrontation that we needed. And I realized I had to break the taboo, you know, like part of coming into your own being was to break the taboo, yeah. was to break through and just say, that's it, I've had it, this is who I am, and I have to take responsibility for yeah. that and go well, We can my extend own. my little metaphor a little farther to say that if you break the shell from the outside, you might kill the chick, you know, you're, not, you're mm -hmm. not helping it. The chick has to peck its own way out. And once it does that, then it has a certain, uh -huh. uh, you know, authority, or, uh, if you will. Right. You know, right. Which it wouldn't have had if you say, "Come on, I'm gonna break the shell for you, let you out of here, and it's right. time for you to leave the incubator." Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. You're not gonna get ushered out in that way. Right. There's a little parallel with that in psychotherapy, actually. Huh. It's like the psychotherapist does not say, "Okay, you have to leave therapy." I mean, that is not empowering. It to dawns the client. on the client. That yes. It's Time to yes, exactly. Fly the coop. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, I sort of phrased it. I like this phrase. I, I, I decided that I wanted to be my own weak little light in my own world, rather mm -hmm. than one of the millions of lights in the grand marquee of my guru. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mm -hmm. just decided, whoever I am, however I am, I'd rather be me. Mm -hmm. I'd rather, you know, come into my own. That's great. And, uh, well, I, it was perhaps we'd be laboring the point to say it again, but it, it's interesting to observe how it happened kind of naturally, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you just grew into it. And, and 
that being the case, uh, and I've seen it in many other cases, I don't think people have to be overly worried about you know people that are in spiritual groups. You know, they're going to. I mean, there have been some really terrible ones, you know, which can't even be classified as spiritual groups, like Jonestown or right. something. But, but in you know relatively healthy ones, which have mm -hmm. a fair degree of legitimacy, mm -hmm. if not great legitimacy. Mm -hmm. People know what to do, you know, and if mm -hmm. it, and they reach a point in their growth where leaving is appropriate, they're going to leave. And maybe for a while they'll build some negative story around it, you know, mm -hmm. oh, this th he said that or she said that mm -hmm. or they, you know, it's not what I thought it was. But you know, that's sometimes just an artifice to give them a little kick. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the person has to build a little negative story to empower themselves before the, they yeah. can get out. And then yeah. usually you look back a couple years later and you say, you know. I appreciate the whole thing was great, just yeah. like you were saying. Yeah. You know, it was just what I needed at that time. It was yeah. a phase I went through. It was extremely helpful, uh -huh. and I'm so grateful. And now I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I I actually decided that everyone actually needs to have a time when they can idealize and worship a great, powerful mm. f other force. And I did not have that with my parents. Yeah. You know, I didn't have that kind of security and adoration. But I needed it, and I found it in this yeah. guru, and it was glorious while I was there. I think particularly when we're younger, we have a tendency to do that mm -hmm. too. You know, you're idealistic, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you think that somebody's got the answers, mm -hmm. and so maybe this guy's got the answers, mm -hmm. and then after all, no, not him. Well, this guy must have them. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to have them. <laughs> you know. Well, I think you're right also, and that people have to grow. They have to get the foundation. Yeah. They have to learn what it's all about. Like. You, you have to read and study and practice and you know and you need a place to do that and you really don't know in the beginning yeah yeah so i went through that i really i really have no regrets at all i gave a ton of money a fortune mm -hmm. i have no regrets i'm very happy about yeah. it and i still deeply honor who adi da has been in my life mm -hmm. and um he's a magnificent teacher he he has written profoundly deep and beautiful books. I've always heard that about him. I've never read any of them. Mm -hmm. And he, in the later years in his life, he became um, a creative photographer oh, right, and artist. Yeah. I saw some of that. I glanced at some websites and saw some yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. Stunning work. Stunning work. Really mm. gorgeous work. And um, he also kind of initiated a unique kind of um, tantric embodied practice hmm. that was different from many of the practices I actually touched into. And I've come to deeply appreciate that in him. Is that relevant to your story? Do you want to go into that or is that just sort of tangen tangential? Well, that does become relevant to my story. Okay. And, but I wanted to, I, I guess I want to tell you how I left that communion. Okay. Because um, I, I met Samuel Bonder, I right. told you that. I recognized that he was a realizer. Mm -hmm. And um, I said to myself, he, you know, he did not encourage me in any way. He was not into taking people away from right. the guru. But I began to pull him out and ask him more and more questions. And then I read his book. And then I said, you know, well, this is a no-brainer. I can just drive an hour up to Marin County yeah. and sit with this man rather than go through all the hoops that it takes to go to Fiji and have a retreat oh, he was with Adi Fiji Jog. by that time, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Right. And so uh, this was like in October. Of what year? Of uh, 95. Okay. So then I went up to Marin County and sat with Samuel. Mm -hmm. Very personal, a very small room, face to face like we are right now. And uh, talked personally about my experience and about where I was and meditated with him and a small group of people. This was really the clincher. I walked away from that meeting and I recognized that I had fallen into the witness consciousness. Hmm. And it you never You mean the very first one of those meetings yes, you went to? Yes, with Samuel. Right. Because I'd been in, I'd touched into the witness many right. times with Adi Da, but I recognized it there again. And to my wondrous surprise, it never left me, never. Describe it a bit, this witness consciousness. Okay. Um, at first, it seemed to emanate from my whole being, mm -hmm. and it was it, I, 
I experience myself as being uplifted, very clear, not different, but more attuned to everything around me, mm -hmm. more in tune with everything around me, yeah. more aware, I guess you would say. Um, my mind was more clear, mm -hmm. and, uh, and everything seemed bright, you know, brighter than ever before. Now, the things you just described, um, the average listener would, you know, hear them as being characteristics of your individuality. Your, everything's brighter, that's your perception. Uh, you felt uplifted, that's an emotion. Um, you know, you felt, I don't know, some of the other things you said, but those can all be sort of associated with just feeling great as an individual person. And I, but I suspect that there's something more to it than that. Or not. Well, you <laughs> know, um, the witness consciousness is a subtle form. A form? It is a subtle form. The witness, witness okay. consciousness uh -huh. is a subtle form. Meaning it has Meaning a sort of it has physical uh, existence as... A, yeah, it has like an Like a inner, table does, but Kind subtle. of like an energetic, subtle existence, mm -hmm. you know. And does it have, as a form, all forms by definition have temporal and spatial boundaries. Does mm -hmm. it have those? Well, I, myself, you know, seem to expand. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I don't know if it had a boundary, right. but I seem to be large and full mm -hmm. and expanded. And um, but, this never, okay, but this never left me. Right. This quality never left me. Mm -hmm. And it also, I also became capable of... Um, keener insight and mm. discrimination. Yeah. It was beyond anything. I, it was suddenly a big leap beyond anything mm -hmm. I had known before. I had experienced it temporarily, but not like this. Not like this in a continuous way, where um, there was a some, something of a transformation. Is this line of questioning, I have more of these, but is this helpful or does it interfere with your explaining what you're, what you're trying to explain? Um, let's or is it see. Okay? No, it's okay. But okay. but maybe I should tell you my. Okay, s say more, and I'll c I can come back in a little bit later. Yeah, That's come back right. in, <laughs> because uh, the awakening that I have, I have experienced and continually experience and teach, may not be definable in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. And the questions you're asking me come a little bit from the traditional side, mm, yeah. you know. And so I want to tell you that first, and then maybe I can get into these more discriminating points with you. Okay. Okay. So um, I started to tell you that Adi Da was a tantric. Right. A tantric. He was not simply a gyani or a, a, a heart devotee, mm -hmm. you know. He was multi-dimensional person and he um, he himself had experiences that were um, completely non-dual and he had experiences that were uh, of a kind of union of himself and the goddess. Hmm. He had the uh, consciousness awareness, many samadhis of that, many Aware, uh, I don't Degrees know. Or well, uh, I don't know what you would say. He was awake in consciousness. Right. And that had no energetic component to it, yeah. you know. And he spent many years observing his own behavior, inner and outer, how it coordinated, and um, what came up in his field, and how the synchronicities occurred, mm -hmm. you know. And in his final realization, he sat quietly in a temple in Los Angeles and realized that um, the feminine form of the goddess had become his him, had become him, that he and she were dancing creation alive. And now this sounds 
maybe kind of far out and weird. But no, but it needs a little elaboration because well, I, I don't want to form of the goddess tantric. You know, we yeah, kind of un okay. Unpack these phrases a little bit <laughs> to, to know what we're actually referring to. Okay, well, um, but maybe that's part of your story. That's part of my story, but yeah. I, I wasn't. I, I don't know if I can give it the kind of fine edge that you would like. Well, okay, so by, by tantric we mean, you know, the um, the uh, the ability or the uh, not ability, but the permission mm -hmm. to use that which is usually forbidden in mm -hmm. practices. Right. You know, to use sexuality, sexuality, substances. Um, right. Just. Meaning drugs. Yeah, right. um, wines, you know, uh, elixirs. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, to be more uh, in the flow of embodied life mm -hmm. rather than in the disposition of uh, mm -hmm. restraint all the time mm -hmm. or like uh, quietly leaning into the background and simply observing and uh, letting everything pass before you in a in a kind of traditional removed, sort of a little removed aloof. or or kind of quietly you know loving and pleasant and illumined right but not lusty in life engaging in the flow of life yeah okay that that's what I mean by tantric okay now I don't know if we want to get into this, but I got quite an earful from a fellow one time who had been with him for 17 years, and I don't, I don't know if I want to get into all this stuff, but it sort of left an impression, you know, mm -hmm. you know what I'm alluding to. And um, so I've always been, a, you know, I, well, I completely, I mean, I'm totally enjoying your story and I honor your whole experience, but uh, there's a little skeptical voice in the back of my mind also, and I'm trying to reconcile that. Um, I mean, in, in India, and I don't know much about all this stuff, actually, but in India there's a tradition uh, of tantrics and of aghoris, I believe mm -hmm. they call them, which are these guys who are completely, you know, don't give a hoot about social conventions and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And they're respected in, in that culture and considered to be um, enlightened, and, and, uh, but just in a very sort of nonconformist way. Mm -hmm. And like you say, they're not trying to sort of be all prissy and, 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 and proper. Proper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're just wild and crazy guys. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of more indigenous to that culture and uh, can get a little dicey in this culture if we're talking about, you know, married people and, and so on and so forth. But um, so I don't, it's kind of a big question mark, don't know what to make of it. But I, undoubtedly, this guy w was a powerful force, you know. Um, I take that for granted, considering the impact he had and, mm -hmm. uh, and the evolutionary influence he had on people like mm -hmm. you and Samuel Bonder mm -hmm. and so on. So there was, you know, obviously something really profound going on there. And well, I don't, I don't I'll dispute tell you. that. I just have, I, I'm just not as knowledgeable as I perhaps could be about what you're saying? Well, you know, I uh, appreciate that you say that, and that is a common, you know, uh, attitude and feeling surrounding Adi Das' work. Yeah. I'm not condemning it. I'm just sort of no. a little dubious because it doesn't fit into my kind of worldview as, mm -hmm. as I have been mm -hmm. raised, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things that don't fit in yeah. my worldview, which I'm sure are completely legitimate, you know? Well, you know, uh, what, I, what I know, what I've discovered is that everyone has a sort of bent of character. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone has unique doorways into this, into, you know, realization. Mm -hmm. And some people are more disposed toward um, coming into realization at the, you, you might say at those levels right. of nonconformity, of you know engagement with matter, mm -hmm. engagement with forbidden elements. Yeah. Some people have more of a feeling for that, more of a, uh, a resonance. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had a resonance for that. 
I wasn't with Adi Da, however, in his most experimental years. Right. So I didn't get abused or I didn't get, you know, um, manipulated in ways that I've heard people did. Right. And I, I'm fine with that. I feel like, well, I didn't need that. I went there, I got what I needed. It awakened me, it enlivened me. I took away so many treasures. Yeah. And I don't even know how to say who this person is. Mm -hmm. I don't even really want to say. I'm sure he was a mystery in many ways. He was a mystery. Yeah. He was a paradox. Yeah. And you know what? We all are. Yeah, I love that. That's my favorite word. I should have a t-shirt made. <laughs> Paradox. <laughs> right. It's just... Uh, so, so this leads into what I've learned is the nature of the realization I've come to. Okay. That the realization is non-dual, it's embodied, and it, it uh, is based in this paradox mm -hmm. where um, there is consciousness, it infuses everything, it is not separate from everything. Spirit and matter are one, okay. and at the same time, they're separate. Yes. So that we as human beings have the capacity to experience both myself as separate from you, mm -hmm. self and other, we are separate, but we also have the capacity to experience non-separateness. Right. And so there are many times when that is happening at the same time. Yes. And so you ca it's hard to speak of this kind of realization, except to say that it's, it partakes of paradox. Oh, I think you're speaking of it very clearly. Okay, good. <laughs> you're doing a good job. Good. Um, but, but see, it's not exactly the traditional realization. It, it's not the words of the I tradition. I think it may be though. Maybe it's not the exact same words, but it's I think the, the concepts are, are probably go back, you know, throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole Sanskrit thing about Brahman mm -hmm. is, as I understand it, Brahman is considered to be, to, to subsume all, everything. It, mm -hmm. it contains all paradoxes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. it's, it contains the absolute, contains the relative, contain, you know, just harmonizes and contain. And if you read Indian literature, um, especially the ones where they tell these stories like the Ramayana or, you know, the various Puranas, mm -hmm. um, so many wild and crazy things. And every single story has the effect of stretch, of throwing you to this, you know, end of the spectrum, then to that end of the spectrum, then to this end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. and then, like this, all this crazy stuff. And you end up kind of with the overall impression that the sort of the, the great intelligence that, you know, essentially we all are, contains this entire play in all of its diversity and harmonizes it perfectly, mm -hmm. all the paradoxes. Mm -hmm. Great, I like that. I'd like, to re I, I'd like to have a few lifetimes to read those stories. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get, get I want to say one thing. Now, it sure. may not mean anything, but um, uh, Adi Da, uh, had uh, this par paradoxical realization, mm -hmm. and he was could not find a reference to it in any literature. Okay. Uh, the particular kind of realization he had. Now I'm just speaking for him, so I don't really can't give you too many details. But he reported that he was going crazy, so he read everything. He he uh, went through everything, and the one place where he found a reference to his own experience was in um, Ramana Maharshi's mm -hmm. writings, yeah. where Ramana Maharshi uh, talked about the realization of the heart on the right. On the right? On the right. Oh, interesting. At the sinoatrial node. Huh. And that the esoteric center of the self was in that anatomy hmm. of the sinoatrial node. Sinoatrial means what exactly? Is well, it? it's the pacemaker of the heart. It's oh. on the right ventricle. It's, a, it's just a part of the heart that... It's, it's the, it's the uh -huh. right ventricle um, valve okay. that opens and closes. And uh -huh. it mysteriously appears in the embryo at about three weeks. Mm -hmm. And it has no other um, uh, tissues around it. It just, suddenly, it just suddenly, creative fiat, it's there. Huh. And it starts beating. Interesting. Then everything else kind of grows. Then everything else grows, and that regulates everything else. Hmm. Well, Ramana Maharshi uh, t 
this story, uh, Sanya likes to tell this story, that he was uh, sitting with a big crowd of people for weeks on end, and his, you know, um, his pundits and people who were with him, they were getting exasperated with Ramana, and they came to him and they said, uh, look, you're just sitting with this people, you know, you're not giving them any mantras, you're not giving them any practices, what's going on? And he said, why should I give them anything? You know, they have to fall into the heart. Yeah. And that was what he, and what he meant was that the center of the self was not the crown. Mm -hmm. It was not the crown, the Sahasrara that opens, you know, that is yogically usually considered the point of the realization yeah. of the self. He said the, the crown has to open and the person experiences that, but after that they have to fall into the heart and he called it the Amrita Nadi, the heart that connected um, the crown and the Nirvikapa Samadhi, the formless realization. But it was connected to the heart because mm. the heart was the a actual source of the intersection of consciousness and all form. Interesting. There's a beautiful verse in the Chandogya Upanishad about the the, the person in, that dwells in the heart that's the size of a thumb or some such that's thing. That's the passage. Is it? Okay. That's the one that Ramana grabbed out of, yeah. the, out of the teachings. There's a fellow here in town who could talk to you for hours and hours about this. I'll have him on the show one time named Rory Goff. And he, but mm -hmm. he's, he's developed this whole elaborate yeah. cosmology of all this yeah. stuff in great yeah. detail. I don't know what he's talking about, but it sounds interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> some uh, uh, Adi Da trans translated it, he said, there is a flame that is extremely minute, mm -hmm. smaller than the on of the grain of rice, mm -hmm. you know, and goes yeah, on. I think that's from the that's it's time. the same one. But yeah. when Adi Da found this, he finally relaxed. He finally mm -hmm. said, okay, there's, there's a reason why I'm feeling this in my heart here. And um, so that became that is what Sanya Bonder brought forward too, is the realization of the heart. Right. The heart on the right, the intersection of all, you know, matter and consciousness. Mm. And so that is basically the realization that I, I fell into. And in a certain kind of way, I didn't spend a lot of time on the ascending or the refinement of consciousness per se. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't spend years meditating and refining and having lots of samadhis and so forth. I had some, I had, you know, at different times, I had Nirvikapa Samadhi even, but I did not spend time refining that pathway. Right. Because it simply became irrelevant to me once my I, I landed here in my heart and, and everything revealed itself as my conscious nature and, um, and I fell into a, a very deep rest from which all seeking fell away. Mm -hmm. My mind completely calmed and calmed down and opened up and my awareness moved out and many different qualities came to the forefront for me. And why would I want to spend time meditating? After that happened to me, I, I didn't meditate for 10 years. Mm -hmm. It felt like, why would I sit down and meditate? Nothing was ever different from having my eyes open. About half the people that I've had in the show have said the same thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of them being people who meditated for decades, you know. Right. But, yeah. Well, I had my share of it. Yeah. But, you know, so in uh, recent years since I moved here and I spend time with Don, I do enjoy meditating. I've gone back to meditating because it's very, um, it's very s relaxing and soothing, soothing to, the to the body. Right. And also because I deepen in my knowing, mm -hmm. in my self-knowing, in my capacity to know what the world is about, what's going on, and I, I enjoy it now. Good. There's like this, this whole, it's like you're going along saying all this stuff and it's like you're throwing flowers as you go and, I, <laughs> and, and I'm 
chasing along behind in my mind, sort of picking up all these flowers. Each <laughs> represents questions that I want to ask you about the things that you're saying. So going back on the path just a little bit okay. and tying it all together, um, is this uh, awakening that you're now talking about of mm -hmm. being centered in the heart, mm -hmm. this, the same one you had when you first went up to Samuel's place in Marin County? No. No, so this is a subsequent development, yes. a, a deepening or a maturation yes. of the original yes. witness consciousness. Yes. Okay. It wasn't a simple maturation either. Huh. I went through a lot of, uh, I went through a lot of uh, transformation at the level of my emotional nature, hmm. and a lot subsequent of to the witness awakening yes. kind of thing. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I also went through um, a revelation of my ego structures that was quite excruciating. Hmm. Well, that'll keep us busy for the next half hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in a way, it's really the ego that's a, a very interesting thing structure. to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what else are you going to talk about? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, consciousness. What, Mark, what, what do you right, think about consciousness? There's nothing to say about it, is there? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let me, let, let's hold that thought because okay. I want to get into that. But I just wanted to wrap up a little bit about the witness thing, and, sure. then, and then let's okay. get into this. Okay. Um, when you first described your witness consciousness awakening, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you you did describe it as though it were just a sort of a, a swelling or an expansion of individuality. At least that's the way it sounded to me. Uh, you know, it got you said it got larger, brighter, mm -hmm. things like that. And if something is larger, it still has dimensions. I mean, is it, does it go as far as the wall? Does it go as far as the next town? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of not, it's still in the realm of space and time. Well, I submit to you that, uh -huh. that witnessing does have that quality. The witness consciousness, I already said, is a form. Mm -hmm. I just submit to you that that's true. And okay. it also has formless qualities, mm. which you've already said it's hard to speak of. You yeah, know? true. It's like uh, well, to, to a certain extent, we're just stab we were kind of defining our terms here, okay? Because you know, uh -huh. people might think of witness right. consciousness in different ways. That's true. I so know. So, <laughs> just want to make sure I understand yeah. how you're defining it. And I. Well, I I use witness consciousness because I don't know what else to call it. I mean, it, it's in the realm of consciousness, mm -hmm. and it. Uh, it was a giant leap in terms mm -hmm. of my awareness and my capacities. Um, it greatly enhanced my life. Mm -hmm. um, it moved me uh, into a lot of spaces. Uh, I was able to observe things I had never observed before. Uh, I had a, a sense of knowing. Um, to my mind, the I word witness kind of implies that it's uninvolved in a way. It's like it's a witness. It's sort of observing it was without that. being so involved. So is that what you, is that yeah, what, that's why that, that adjective is used? Witness. Yes, yeah. it had that quality. Yeah. It had the quality that I was like vast and not touched mm -hmm. and silent. just in a kind of blissful, silent enjoyment yeah. of everything. And you probably noticed that even if you're dri driving through rush hour traffic, oh, yeah. you know, it was just there, there's the craziness of the traffic, yeah. but there's this vast, silent, yes. Yes. uninvolved quality. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that was that, was that phase that yeah. lasted about um, four months, mm -hmm. and it was quite wonderful, quite enjoyable. And then, uh, I don't know what you would say, being took me down to another place. <laughs> it reveals something else about me uh -huh. that was uh, much more startling, much more difficult to endure. What was that? And that was that, um, you know, I, I was in a uh, study group with Samuel and some other people, and just in an instant like that, I embraced a friend of mine mm -hmm. I had known for seven years or so, and I don't know what happened to me. I suddenly fell madly in love with him. Hmm. And all kinds of energy started pouring down my body. It was like an initiation process. Hmm. And um, it, was, it was totally a shock to me. It, was it, he having the same experience? No, not exactly, no, no. no. But um, I had a chance to talk with him about hmm. it later. 
He was married, he had a kid, he had a job, <laughs> he, he was not interested. <laughs> right. But I had known him for seven or eight years, you know, and we were close friends, we were colleagues, actually. Yeah. And so we talked about what is this phenomena, you know, and um, it was good to have him to talk about, but there was nowhere to go with it. Yeah. That's, that's what was so maddening. Well, do you think it was innately him, or was he a convenient sort of magnet for uh, a transformation that you were on the brink of yes. undergoing? Yes. And that uh, here, here, okay, this guy yes. is here, could have been the other guy, but yes. he was here. So That's right. <laughs> That's right. Zingo. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. It was part of my transformation. Right. And it, to him, it wasn't any big deal, you know. Yeah. It was, he could hold it, he could be with it, he could talk about it, and it wasn't a bother to him. Right. To me, it was a big bother. Yeah. Because it was revealing to me a, a deficit in my own character, you know, in my own emotional life, early life, bonding life, you know, uh, with my parents. And during the next six months, I still was able to witness all of this, but my body and mind were going through tortures. Mm -hmm. It was awful. Don't do the <laughs> yeah. It was totally awful. And I had a chance to notice how, how innately crazy the ego is, mm -hmm. you know? I made up all kinds of stories. I justified my behavior. I attributed all kinds of evil to him. <laughs> I uh, m had all kinds of schemes and manipulations go on in my mind. Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, totally victimized. I, I can't tell you. I was crazy. Hmm. I was fantasizing. I was like, I was out of my mind. Was that movie mind. with Glenn Close and Michael Douglas? And <laughs> <laughs> Something about you know that one. Body heat. No. No. <laughs> you know that movie I'm talking about. It's like anyway. Anyway, I know. I know what movie you mean. <laughs> Obsession or some kind. It was fatal attraction. Fatal attraction. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. It was like that. Yeah. It was like, it was like this incredible workout. Hmm. And furthermore, did he you know anybody else in the Samuel group that was going through stuff like that, or was it just you that? Kind well, of other people went through other things, mm -hmm. but but here's the th here's the tight squeeze for me. He was in the group. He didn't want anyone to be apprised of this. Right. He didn't want me to tell Samuel. Mm -hmm. He was really into protecting his own life. Right. He had it all together. It was all very neat. It was all going well. Mm -hmm. And um, he wasn't into having anything exposed. Right. And... And there was n nothing going on because he no. wanted his life to just Right. Be there was nothing yeah. going on right. except I was going through torture. You were going through your thing, yeah. And um, this went on like for six months. And I was just, finally I just said, okay, this is it, uh, this is my life, you know, what can I do? I can't get out of it, I don't know how to get out of it, I can't get on with it. <laughs> um, I was in a relationship and, and part, of, part of the realization was that the relationship I was in actually hadn't been working for a long time. Right. So I did confront that and I decided to um, get out of that relationship. I got my own place, you know, I got established on my own. And I just said, okay, here I am. What can I do? This is it. Well, about six months later, everything broke in a way I never would have expected. Hmm. This man walked into our small group. What man? The man the, that you were crazy about? The man that about. I was crazy about. Yeah. And he came into Samuel's group one day quite unexpectedly, and he, he looked horrible, like he was deathly ill, mm -hmm. and he announced that his wife, the night before, had left him, taken their child, was marrying, was divorcing him, and marrying her business partner. Mm -hmm. I was totally stunned, m mainly because I thought I knew what it was all about. I thought I knew what the situation was. Mm. I thought, you know, I was just going to be suffering this particular life for a really long time. And I thought that his life was known. And suddenly, you know, within the space of 12 hours or so, I didn't really talk to him anymore, but I went home to my own home and my whole 
mind collapsed. I don't know if you can get the drift of it. Everything just blew wide open. It's like all the assumptions I had made about myself, about what life is, mm -hmm. about, you know, uh, what kind of life I was going to be having. Everything crashed, crashed. Well, that's, I mean, you know, you had kind of come to terms with the fact that nothing was ever going to happen with this guy because he was pretty established in the mm -hmm. life he was living, and yet you were, you know, you had this, you were in love with him. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the, the possibility of actually getting together with him dawned on, in, yes, on, on the scene. Yes, and, and that dawned on the scene. And then when it became possible, you like went home and dropped the whole thing? Is, is that what you're saying? Well, I went home <laughs> and I, like, it's like my jaw was dropped. I was a gape, gaping. I was like, I did ha entertain the idea, well, what if he would be available someday? Well, now no. it seemed like he was. Yeah. Now yeah. it seemed like he might be. Well, that, that didn't happen. We did finally get together uh, for a while, a few months later. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, the main thing was that it blew open my assumptions about everything. Hmm. Can you give us an example of how it blew open your assumptions? I mean, you were, what were you assuming and how did that get blown apart? Well, I was assuming, like, when, a really big thing for my own ego was, I never get what I want. Uh -huh. um, oh. so I'll the, never so get... So the destruction of that one was, hey, I could have what I right. want now. Right, right. Okay. And, or, I'm, I'm just doomed to suffer. This is my life. Mm -hmm. uh, emotion, emotional torture. Were you conscious of these assumptions, or were they just kind of guiding you without... I was somewhat conscious of yeah. them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and also, there's like a way in which I had merged with him so much that I, I was completely shocked for him. Because mm -hmm. I knew all the value he had stacked into his life. Right, you knew how traumatic it must be for him. Oh, I was so... Right. Shocked for him. Yeah. I was so astounded that his life, that he had carefully protected, could turn out like that. Yeah. And it was like out of the blue. Right. It was out of the blue for him. He was totally... Floored, yeah. Yeah. So that, all that together, rendered me sort of like helplessly raw and open. Hmm. And the next thing that arose that I knew that I uh, that arose out of me was a review of all my relationships that I'd ever had. Hmm. My parents, my family, my friends, my sister, y everyone I had ever known, every partnership I had ever had, my children, people I had taught with, people I knew at school, they all came before me and I began to spontaneously sing a song of praise to each one hmm. out loud in my room, in oh, the really? middle of my bed. You made up little songs and yes. sang them? <laughs> yes, uh -huh. and I, and I internally I bowed to them, I thanked them for everything they had been in my life. I saw that my life was completely perfect as it was. Was and this uncharacteristic for you to be doing something yes. like this? But it was just a spontaneous mo impulse Outpouring. to do it. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes, and um, that went on for a couple of hours. Hmm, amazing. And it was like, by then it was... Totally, you actually made up songs just uh, out of your, that no yeah. one had ever composed. Well, I, I did. You were just like putting some no, tune I, to I, a Beatles also, song or something. No, I also <laughs> used a tune that I, that I had learned at when I was at uh, graduate school. Okay. Yeah. And I elaborated on it, uh -huh. and I spoke to all these people, and I thanked them, and I blessed them, and I cool. remembered. So it was like a little ceremony almost. It was a ceremony. Yeah. It was like a puja. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was like a celebration mm -hmm. for each one. And at the end of it... It seems like it's really symptomatic. I mean, it's not like you're just indulging in a moody thing. It's like symptomatic of a huge kind of resolution that was taking place was. deep within you, and you were just kind of expressing it on the surface. This is it. Yeah. That's a nice way. You have a good way of words. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. And at the end of that time, like, I finally laid down, really kind of like 
leveled, you know, right. and opened and spent. Yeah. And then uh, a most amazing thing happened. Like my crown chakra opened up mm -hmm. and I felt this energy very, very fine, which I kind of called it silver rain. Mm -hmm. It came pouring softly through my head mm. and descended down my entire body. Like tingles of bliss. Tingles or of bliss yeah. and very fine mm -hmm. energy. And it soothed me and I fell asleep. Wow, very nice. And that was, I thought that was the end of it. And I woke up a couple hours later because it was almost morning. Mm -hmm. And I got up and I felt fine. And I got ready to go to work. And I walked down the hallway. And then I, then suddenly I noticed, well, this is interesting. You know, it doesn't seem like there are any hall walls here. It seems like I'm, I am in touch with the outside. Ah. And, and that expansiveness went on, in a very, but it was very subtle. It wasn't psychic. It was a very subtle awareness that expanded far, far out. Mm. And um, this was like on a Friday morning. Then on, uh, this went on over the weekend. Good, so you didn't have to go to work. The next I days. know. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> <laughs> this went on over the weekend, and uh -huh. then I went and I, I had a meditation on Sunday with Samuel up in Marin County. And during that time, during the meditation, I had um, a confirmation of my awakening hmm. in so. yogic terms. Well, I was sitting there, and my meditation was deepening and deepening and deepening, and all of a sudden, I heard this very still voice inside of my, my heart. And it said, it was a traditional phrase from some traditional writings. Uh, when the, let's see, how does it go? When the, um, when the goddess is well pleased with the, with the meditation of the devotee, she opens as vichara in his heart and expands as the rising sun. Hmm. And like that was kind of enacted. That and phrase just came to you. Yes. Yeah. It just came to me. It said itself right here. You had heard it before, but I had. Right. And and then and then it all completely opened up again. This great uprising of well being and expansiveness. Hmm. And I just said to myself, oh, I've awakened. Interesting. I knew it. Yeah. I've awakened. You've taught me something very interesting here about uh, the distinction between the witness and what you subsequently have just described. Mm -hmm. You know? My neck's getting sore from turning sideways <laughs> too much. Um, it's a, I'll have to think about that more, uh, you know, because um, that, that witness experience is something I'm very familiar with, mm -hmm. but um, you know, this stage that you're describing now, I don't think has really dawned for me yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's helping me, uh, th it's clarifying my understanding to see that distinction. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, if you listen to uh, the White Hot Yoga of the Heart, you would have heard it, you know, you would have heard it before. Right. And um, it's the embodied witness the witness yeah. becomes fully embodied mm -hmm. and coincident with one's experience in every moment. Yeah. Well, that part's okay. I can get. I mean, you know. No, but, in but in a it, very full in, in way. In a very full way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what year was this? So this was ninety six. That was my awakening, October fourth okay. of ninety six. Mm -hmm. And so it was pretty much, yeah, you know, like you just said it, October fourth. And so the third and the fifth were very different days, and mm -hmm. it was the fourth. <laughs> yeah. And it was irrevocable. I mean, yes. you know, nothing has caused it. Even when you've gotten the flu or something like that, doesn't have any. It never changes. Right. I mean, this does not mean I'm not. I don't have an ego. Right. This does not mean I don't hit limitations. Mm -hmm. But you know, they more or less ev evaporate fairly quickly. Yeah. It's interesting mm -hmm. because I've been listening to a, there's this uh, website and podcast called the Urban Guru Cafe, 
Hmm. And it's, uh, it's all these people who are kind of associated with this guy in Australia named Sailor Bob Adamson, um, who was a disciple of Nisargadatta, who of course was a disciple of Ramana Maharshi. Mm -hmm. And so they all talk in this sort of Advaita kind mm -hmm. of way. But they, they all seem to be saying, you know, there is no person, there is no personal identity. You know, the, the, the thought, the notion that there is, is just some kind of illusion, and so on and so forth. And they go on and on with this point over and over again. And to me, that kind of sounds like one side of the coin, and it doesn't really do justice to this paradox concept in which, you know, I am and I'm not a person simultaneously, mm -hmm. and there's no conflict or contradiction between mm -hmm. both of those things, mm -hmm. which I think is what you would say, is it? This is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, the person that you thought you were is gone, mm -hmm. and you still have ego structures, because how could we be here? How could we function? Yeah. How could we know that I am I over here and you are there? Right. And you know, we couldn't operate on the world of phenomena mm -hmm. if we didn't have an ego. So but the person the you thought you were was gone, so, so totally what, gone. what is left in the sense that what do you think you are now, if that's, that's a <laughs> weird way of putting it, but uh -huh. what do you take yourself to be? If you had to describe yourself in, in a couple of minutes, you know, how, how would you go about it? Um, I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Because more and more I come to this, um, I know, I have this come to me all the time, that whatever you can say about this right now, mm -hmm. uh, in a little while you won't be able to say that. And you won't even re be able to remember what you said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, like, you know, if you went to up to the average person and said, who are you? What mm -hmm. are you? Mm -hmm. They'd say, you know, I'm Joe Smith, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, well, that's your name, but mm -hmm. what are you? Well, I'm six foot tall, and I weigh mm -hmm. 170 pounds, but no, that's just the, you're talking about your physical body. Mm -hmm. What are you? Well, I like, you know, I, I work at such and such right. a place. I, right. like, I like bowling, and I like strawberry ice cream. Yeah. No, those are just your, your preferences, you know, uh -huh. in terms of tastes and th uh -huh. activities, but what are you? Right. You know, and you can go out and on like that, and you'll never pin them down. Right. Um, so, you know, if I were to try to do that to you, uh, would I? Would it just? Would it be equally frustrating, or would you? Do you have a sort no, of? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I could like it's going through my head right now. Okay, uh -huh. I am a location uh -huh. of a collection of conditions mm -hmm. through which consciousness operates in a particular way in this universe. That's great. You should write, somebody should write that down. Because <laughs> you're not going to remember it in five no, minutes. No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I am a location. Mm -hmm. Of a particular set of conditions. A particular set of conditions. That are more or less stable. Uh -huh. They come and go. but They, they fluctuate. They fluctuate, yeah. but they kind of return to the same location. Yeah. And uh, these conditions are... Through which consciousness expresses itself. Yes, life expresses itself mm -hmm. and lives as this location in this particular mm. way. Some people like to say we're sense organs of the in, of the infinite. You know? That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Well, that, that's very interesting. But there, do you, do you have a sense of, you know, I mean, that's a kind of a, what you just said is a sort of fancy phrase. Mm -hmm. But do you have a sense of being a person? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I have a sense of being a person. Just as much as you did when you were 15 years old? I mean, no, not the same. Some quite flavor of it still, well, or completely different? Well, well, um, there's some, there's some uh, qualities that persist. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, like, for instance, when I was 15, you know, I was really concerned, you know, am I good looking? Am I cool? Do girls like me? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. how, how come I'm so scrawny and I'm not good at sports? And, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, how is my hair getting long enough? You know, uh -huh. All this sort of concerns about very isolated personal uh -huh. identity, you know. And these days, it's not only because I'm 60 and not 15. Uh -huh. I think it's because I've, you know, been doing this spiritual work because a lot of people my age are getting facelifts mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, and they're still very concerned about uh -huh. that stuff. Uh, but there's just no awareness or, con or concern uh -huh. for any of the sort of minute personal considerations like that. They, they just not, never mm -hmm. enter my mind. Um, in fact, my wife has to practically dress me so I don't come out looking like a hick every day. <laughs> um, but um, so... And yet, and this is the reason I started on this tangent, okay. and, and yet, 
there's still very much a, s a sense of, of, you know, personhood, sitting here on this couch mm -hmm. talking to you. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's the awareness and the witness and mm -hmm. the silence and all that, but there's mm -hmm. a sense of, you know, somebody here. I, uh, yeah, of course, I do have that sense of somebody here. I, I feel that I'm quite um, morphed from what I was, although I still have a lot of the same qualities, and mm -hmm. of course I have a person, and I have an ego, and I have sensibilities and sensitivities and preferences, and but you know what? I experience a lack of concern about it most of mm -hmm. the time. Not, not that I um, am uncaring for this, Right. Uh, that I am. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. I take care of myself. Yeah. I take care of my attitudes. I take care, you know, to um, to be present and to listen to others and to to be a responsible citizen as much as I can. I take mm -hmm. care of where I'm involved yeah. and where I'm engaged, but I am not um, deeply concerned about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not, for the most part, I am not deeply disturbed and neurotic like I was. Would you say that, uh, this is very <laughs> helpful to me actually, would you say that the reason for that may be that um, your primary identity or identification is with something that is much larger than that, you know, much larger than this personhood who needs to be sure to drive in the right hand lane and, you know, and eat the right foods and all that stuff. I mean, you know, the whole waking down thing is about l living enlightenment in an embodied sense, yes. you know, or not being sort of right. airy fairy, ethereal, right. you know, consciousness right. who right. has uh, anorexia. Right. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, in my experience anyway, it, there's a sense of, you know, even though both things are going on at the same time, mm -hmm. and there's this paradox. There's a sense of primary identification, and and primarily, I, I would say. I reside in that in that silence, and secondarily, not less significant, but just as perhaps with a little bit less emphasis, there's the individual concerns and, mm -hmm. and preferences and activities. Mm -hmm. Oh, how would I speak to that? Let's see. I I don't I rarely ever think about it anymore. I'm not sure that I would say that I'm identified with something bigger. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm identified as what is, moment to moment. And that contains everything. Yeah, it contains everything that comes within my field of awareness. Yeah, you know? yeah. And um, I don't know that I would say that I'm primarily identified with consciousness, although that may be true. Yeah. But. I'm just primarily identified with everything, with the with consciousness and form. Yeah. And um, it does seem a little inappropriate to split it up like that, you know. Having yeah. listened to what I just said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's too compartmentalized the way yeah. I made it sound. Yeah. And you know, it really isn't that compartmentalized. But no, I, for me, it is there. At any time I check, I can. Yeah, I'm. I can identify myself as consciousness, mm -hmm. and I certainly am um, not the same solid character that right. I was. There's a sense that things flow through me and permeate and mm -hmm. move, and and there are nuanced layers upon layers, but it's not stacked and packed like it mm. used to be. You still have that sense that you did that morning when you woke up after going through that mm -hmm. big catharsis that. Uh, you know, it's as if the walls aren't there and the spaciousness just extends without any Not obstructions. Not quite to that same or degree. It was more at, at other times. More the, vivid when it first oh dawned. Oh yeah, it yeah. was more vivid in, yeah. that, in that time. Uh, but that returns every now and then, mm -hmm. you know, in a very beautiful way. And so now my awareness is sometimes expansive and sometimes narrow and sometimes in between. And mm -hmm. I would say more. Depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I would say more than anything, it's kind of in-between. I think I'm a kind of an in-between character. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not really extreme in any way. Yeah. Um, I'm quite familiar with the gross <laughs> uh -huh. and the subtle, you know, and, and the conscious nature. 
and um, I don't think about it too much anymore, except when people ask me questions. Yeah. And I try to convey to them the idea of it. You know? When you're teaching and the waking mm -hmm. down thing, you must mm -hmm. be thinking about it then somewhat? Or? You know, I don't even think ahead. I, I, I do make a plan like today. I even made a little outline. Which you haven't even looked at. That's true. <laughs> I haven't had to look at it. I, I make a little plan, and then I wait, and I see what people need. Right. And like when, this is one of the delightful things about where I am now, is like, when there's an energy kind of needing and requesting something and it's put to me, there is something in me that opens up and kind of gives mm. forth. Like, it flows out of me. I don't mm. have to think about it. You spontaneously know how to respond, yes. yeah. Yes. Yeah, Maharshi actually used to use the analogy of the teacher being like a reservoir and, you know, it would naturally flow if somebody hooked a pipe up to it. And if nobody hooks up a pipe, then it doesn't flow. But whatever, I suppose, whatever the capacity of the pipe they hook up, that's how much it, it will flow. I totally can understand that. Yeah. Completely understand that. Do you, um, in your own personal, do you still have a sense of personal growth? Like from year to year, you feel like, mm, I'm progressing. Yeah, you know, things are much more clear or whatever than they were a year ago and so on. Yeah, thank goodness. Or yeah. Why would I You'd be get here? boring, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do have a sense of personal growth. I have a sense of having desires to open up to something, you mm -hmm. know, and know more about it and um, involve yeah. myself to the degree that you know, I can get more of a handle on it, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm still, I, I guess that's what has persisted from my early life. I'm an inveterate learner. Yeah. You know. So you naturally are cu always curious. And yes. Yeah. yeah. But without the sense of craving that, that characterizes most seekers. That's right. Yeah. I used to go in a bookstore and I just couldn't stand it, you know. Yeah. It's like, how can I get all this knowledge? Where do I begin? <laughs> yeah. For many years then I didn't even go in a bookstore and now I'm back to bookstores because I feel like, I feel the questions of my students mm -hmm. and I want to have something, you know. Yeah, you want to be equipped to answer. I want to be equipped yeah. to l allow something to come forth. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I have this sense, I, I used to have this desperate kind of sense of seeking and, and you know, just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, frustration and yearning and all this mm -hmm. stuff ripping me apart. And now I'm, I'm probably, uh, you know, by all observances, I'm as ardent a seeker as I ever was in terms of being interested in this kind of stuff, talking about yeah, it all the time, yeah. listening to tapes and reading yeah, books and whatnot. But, um, but there's no sense of need. You know, yes. there's no sense of yearning or seeking. It's like, right. it's I'm content and just keep putting icing on the cake. Right. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I'm, you know, I'm never without several books I'm reading. Yeah. And um, I enjoy learning. I enjoy uh, opening up to new experience. But like you, like as with you, it, it, it's not a deal breaker. It doesn't make a difference on whether or not I'm okay. Yeah. If someone were to tell you, sorry to throw you a curveball, but if someone were to, to tell you, you know, uh, with certainty and you knew they were telling the truth, you're going to die tomorrow, mm -hmm. how do you feel like you would react? Well, I think I would take it in stride. Mm -hmm. I think I would start contemplating what that would be like and mm -hmm. what I needed to do before I died. Mm -hmm. And, um, feel more deeply into the, you know, how my life stacks up and um, enjoy, you know, wh what I have learned and accomplished mm -hmm. and I would yeah. want to have time to evaluate it. Yeah. That I would wish for that. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a nice answer, mm -hmm. you know, because I think it would be informative to many people to hear that answer because mm -hmm. I think many people uh, perhaps not so much people who are really sort of on a spiritual path, but m most people in the world would probably freak out pretty bad if, if they discovered they were going to die tomorrow. You know, mm -hmm. there'd be a lot of fear and a lot mm -hmm. of worry and remorse and, and whatnot. Um, I, I, I don't rule those things out that they might come to me, you know, because that's not having had that 
experience. I don't. Yeah, it's know. hard to say. It's easy to say in yeah. the abstract what you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what would arise. I might. I, I can imagine that I might have some fear, mm -hmm. and uh, some uh, grief about leaving so suddenly. And yeah. But you probably have a sense that, you know, essentially you wouldn't die. That you know, there it would just be sort of a new adventure. I think I have a sense of that. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I've actually had. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Do you need any water or anything? Uh, no, I think okay. I'm fine. I have had experiences in my sleep where you know, uh, especially in the, those days when I had this blooming forth of consciousness, where I would turn over and then I would feel myself <coughs> lifting out of my body, and mm. I, I said. To Oh, this is what it's like to die. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just had that recognition. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Huh. So, um, do you feel, is there anything that we haven't talked about, which when you get home you're going to think, oh, we should have talked about that. Uh, is there anything you can think of that, you know, is either in your notes or that you generally like to talk about when you talk about this stuff that I haven't touched upon or asked you about? Uh, you know, let me see. I'm going to look them over just because. Sure. Um, yeah. um, well, I guess I want to say that um, I don't feel like my realization, while it's pretty summary. Mm -hmm. and pretty summary? Uh, S U M M or? S U M M A R Y. Uh -huh. It summarizes my life pretty uh -huh. nicely, my awareness. It's comprehensive, I would right. say. Um, I don't expect it to be the last awakening I have. Mm -hmm. I oh, do oh, think there. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I think there will be other awakenings. Yeah. And um, other intensities and other openings. And um, I don't. In other words, I don't feel like this is a finished uh, deal. Right. At all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. And probably your experience has borne that out so far, that there have been de yeah. degrees and, you know, stages of further yeah. awakening. Yeah. 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 And so uh, I think that's important to say. It's like, this is a journey which, um, in which I think being wants to incorporate more and more and more and more and more and more yeah. of its own nature. Mm -hmm. And... Um, like I say, I'd like to have a lot of time to just open up to all these things. Yeah. That seem so enticing. You know? well, I'm glad you're saying that because I, I can relate to that um, very much. And I, I'm a little puzzled by these guys that I sometimes listen to or read who just say either you're awake or you're not. And when you are, that's it. And they really kind of put down the idea of progressive awakening and stages and so on and so forth. And... and um, I sort of feel when I listen to them, and there are plenty of authors and speakers and teachers who, who speak this way, I sort of feel like they're in for some surprises, uh, <laughs> unless they really manage to keep a lid on it for, <laughs> for a long time. Be because, it, it, you know, just the experience that I'm more common, mo more familiar with among all the people I know, there continue to be, you know, awakenings. Um, in fact, originally I was going to call this show Awakenings, Mm -hmm. And um, but it's I don't know too familiar a term. And somebody came yeah. up with Buddha at the gas pump, which I thought I thought was more clever. <laughs> but um, good. you know, I mean, it's kind of the nature of life to evolve and to grow, and mm. and it, it just seems kind of static. I mean, and also when you when you can when you meet great sages and and people like that, you you think well, you know, sure I have an I've had an awakening maybe, but I don't seem to quite have everything that person has, and maybe it's the same essence we have, the same mm -hmm. consciousness. It's not mm -hmm. like different consciousness there, mm -hmm. but the degree to which it's kind of appreciated subjectively by that person and radiated mm -hmm. to others by that person seems to f vastly exceed mine, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you relate to that way of lo uh, looking yeah, at it? Yeah, I, I absolutely can relate to that. Yeah. And, you know, so combining my interest in psychology, mm -hmm. And a lot of studies I've done about personality types, mm -hmm. um, I am thoroughly convinced that people have 
different expressions in their awakening. Like some people are very like structured personality-wise, and even I study this human, human design, mm -hmm. which is a very um, detailed and concrete and very specific uh, multi-level interpretation of your astrology. Oh. And um, it, it shows you how very graphically how people have openings in certain areas of their being and not in other areas. Mm -hmm. So, people are going to, like Adi Da once said this in one of his early books, go forth and realize according to your own nature. And so everyone is going to realize in a little bit different way from everyone else. Mm. And some people will have the capacity to be very, you know, full in consciousness and knock you over with Darshan. Darshan, right. their radiance and right. their clarity. And other people will be very full in the loving heart mm -hmm. and, the f and the beautiful watery flow of connection. Mm. And, and some might have brilliant intellect. Yes. And, and none of this uh, says that people are not awake. Right. People are awake according to their own nature. And they're not going to be awake according to so-and-so's nature. And that, that is an important thing that I think has to be taken into consideration when we talk about awakenings. And if you have a non-dual awakening and your own body-mind is paradoxically wedded to your conscious nature, your own body-mind is not the same body-mind as someone else, but the awakening can be functioning in you in the same manner but the quality and content of that awakening can vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things about waking down. Like we really have, we have really learned that uh, to assist people into awakening is to invite them to be themselves right. without efforting. Yeah. To let go of the disciplines, to relax into who you are, just who you are, and to speak from there and, and to, you know, um, like be seen from who you are. And, and what is non-essential to you will begin to purify out and what is essentially unique about you will remain. Hmm. And that cannot happen if you're just cracking the disciplines, <coughs> you know. And so validating people's uniqueness is what jump starts them into their own awakening. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to match them to the model you have that was handled down, handed down from this teacher to this teacher <laughs> to this teacher to this teacher, right. that model will not suit. It will not suit that many people. It suited the teacher who drafted it, and everybody has their own way of voicing, speaking, and acting, expressing, their uniqueness, and it's not separate from their own awakening. Once this, you know, paradoxical, embodied, non-dual awakening is recognized. Very good. That's my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, now your, your teacher juices are really yeah. flowing now. Um, but it's very important. Yeah, you know? no, I agree. Um, it's, it's, it's a good point, and it's unfortunately often not appreciated or, you know, not lived in some spiritual circles, you know, mm -hmm. where everyone seems to conform to a mold and dress a certain way and act a certain way and speak a certain way and use the same hand gestures and, you know, whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> well, all you can say is I, I went through a period. It's a phase. Uh, I, it's yep. a phase. I was yep. a devotee for 10 years and yeah. I did that. And it, it's a learning phase. And when people are ready, they'll break out, like you said before. Yeah. If we uh, use the term uh, awakening or awakenings um, to refer to kind of the sequential progressive shifts or stages or unfoldments or whatever you want to call them, um, do you uh, envision uh, kind of an ultimate stage which for which we might reserve the term enlightenment uh, in which such unfoldments cease? Um, or do you feel like it's a never-ending 
thing. Personally, I can't imagine that these unfoldments will ever cease. Mm. That's my answer. That's yeah. my way of understanding the universe. Yeah, so I suppose it's conjectural, to, but that's the way it feels to you. Yeah, yeah. and uh, also I've been looking into Ken Wilber's integral theory. Well, I, was, yeah, I was wondering a minute ago whether, when you started talking yeah. about that discipline you studied, whether you were referring mm -hmm. to Ken Wilber, but then you said astrology, so I guess it was... No, human design is another It's a different thing, it's yeah. It's another discipline. Yeah, I like Ken Wilber's stuff. Ken Wilber, uh, I will, the way he uh, describes a fully enlightened person, uh -huh. you know, it's someone who's awake in all quadrants, all lines, all levels. Huh. <laughs> you think there is such a thing, um, yeah, such a person? Well, he says it would be pretty impossible. Yeah. And also I like what he says is that our, our understanding of spirituality is constantly evolving. As a culture, as a, as a, as a society. As a, as a society, right. as, a, you know, as a line of development. Our, uh, the, the spirituality itself is evolving, so yeah. um, there will be new frontiers that we cannot even imagine now. That's mm. what I say. Andrew Cohen talks a lot like that, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, even the fact that we're sitting here having this conversation is, you know, a reflection of what you just said, because mm -hmm. the whole idea of spiritual awakenings uh, in times past was considered, like you said earlier in the evening, so rare mm -hmm. that there might only be a, a handful of such people on the planet at any mm -hmm. given time. Mm -hmm. And as it is now, I mean, I've been doing this show since October and I have a different person on the couch every week, you know? <laughs> right. And most of them, I think, you know, have undergone very legitimate and yeah. abiding uh -huh. awakenings. Um, you know, it so is So it's kind of con true. Some, some kind of epidemic going on for which yeah. we don't really need a vaccine. Yeah, right, we don't. Yeah. No, I know. It's either we live in extraordinary times or uh, being has decided to um, change the plan. I don't know. Yeah. I kind of like to think that, you know, I mean, one way of looking at it is that I mean, people who aren't aware that this phenomenon is taking place are, are wondering whether, uh, you know, the world is about to end because the problems seem to be getting more and more severe. And, and Time magazine just put out an issue called The Decade from Hell to refer to the last <laughs> 10 years, yeah. and they itemized all the horrible things that had happened and, and yeah. so on and so forth. And you know, a lot of people are getting very upset and discouraged and losing their houses and losing their money and, and everything else. And, uh, but it seems like in a, in a subtle way, uh, subtle because it's not so obvious that it's going to make Time magazine, there's an, uh, a corresponding upwelling of you know, consciousness or awakening and, and so on, and, and it's just kind of spreading and becoming more and more common and, and counterbalancing this yucky stuff that's going on. And perhaps this yucky stuff that's going on on a societal level is kind of a, similar to what you went through after your initial yeah, awakening when right. you had to purge all kinds of right. nonsense that had accumulated yes. over the years. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. So maybe the world is purging right now because there's such an, ups, uh, an upwelling of consciousness yeah. happening. I I don't know, but don't you know, either, it's, it's such a mystery. They, they talk about time speeding up, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great mystery. And I more and more just return to nobody really knows what's causing anything. Yeah. And um, we, we all play it knowing because that's what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. but, but we really can't put our finger on it. And we don't know where it's going. And we don't know where it came from. And it's fun to speculate. It's fun to speculate. <laughs> but that's, a, you know, as long as you don't say this is the way it is and this is what's happening. Yeah. But, you know, it's fun to play with possibilities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's our delight to do that. Yeah, and it's fun to be uh, along for the ride at this point, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting, uh, there's some great quote about this, but it's, it's, it's great, a uh, fascinating time to be alive, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, much better this than the Middle Ages, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Where you could get burned at the stake for yes. having a conversation like this. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alrighty, well on that cheery note, um, <laughs> maybe we should wrap it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so grateful for our time. Yeah, thanks Sandra. I really, I really enjoyed this. Um, Rick, you're a great interviewer. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I just, I'm sure you would be too. I'm sure you are. 
It's just I had this idea to have a TV show, so here we yeah. are. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to have been asked. Yeah. We'll do it again, actually. I mean, next time you have a breakthrough, okay. call me up. <laughs> we'll do another one. All right. Um, so thank you all for watching. This has been uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, the implication of that title, by the way, meaning that what we were just talking about, that uh, ordinary people are having spiritual awakenings and uh, experiencing life from a perspective that was once considered to be the sole province of, you know, rare and, and uh, sacred beings. Now it's becoming fairly commonplace. Um, this past week I created a blog and that will lead to, and the blog URL by the way is batgap.com, which is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump. Um, and that will also lead to an uh, iTunes, what do you call it, podcast thing, where you can download these interviews, uh, definitely audio, maybe also video. Some people have expressed interest in that and uh, watch them as podcasts. And by the time you actually see this show, that'll all really be happening. Right now, it's probably months before this thing will actually be on the air. But in any case, at the end of the show, as always, there will be titles. And in the titles, you will see uh, a URL for the blog, for a chat group where people are talking about this stuff all day long, uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump Yahoo group, um, and for the iTunes uh, thing where you can get the podcasts and whatever else we can, and for an email address where you can get contact me if you have questions for guests. And in the blog, actually, uh, many of my guests will be participating because their particular interview will be posted uh, in, as a particular, as a uh, whatever you call them in, in blogs, you know, it'll be there <laughs> discreetly. And e within each post of each guest's uh, interview, there will be a comment thing that you can get into and ask questions and, and get into discussions and, and so on. So uh, if you go to batgap.com, you'll see that. And most of my guests, I think, will be perhaps willing to go in there and answer questions or discuss what they've been talking about on the show. So that was a long-winded way of concluding this. I'd like to again thank Sandra Glickman for coming in uh, and being with us this time. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>